about another facet of our preparedness plans, and that is communications. And uh, if you, you don't know it yet, but by the end of my presentation, I, my objective is I would like all of you to get motivated enough by this to go take a test and get your ham radio license. We'll talk about that some more, but that's where I'd like to leave you by the end of the presentation here. So in my own personal preparedness plans, I like to look at about six areas. We've touched on quite a few of these this morning already, food and water and uh, medical and hygiene. I also think about shelter. You know, I heat my home with a wood stove. The last few days I've burned some wood, but I'm perfectly comfortable if the power goes out for three days or a week or all week. I've got three or four cords of wood there. Transportation, think about if the grid went down and things really went bad with an EMP, your car might not work anymore. You might do some things to plan around that. Security and personal defense, I encourage you to get your concealed carry license. Learn, 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 practice, practice with your weapon. But this morning I want to talk about communications. Um, so let me give you a little scenario here. This works better at night than it does in the daytime. Let's say we were sitting here in a meeting and all of a sudden all the lights went off. Okay, no big deal. We all go through power outages. You probably maybe uh, we're not here with a television nearby, so you might grab your cell phone and check the weather or a news feed or something. And so what happened if you looked at your phone and no signal, nothing? Now you might start to wonder what's going on. So I would probably go out to my truck and uh, turn on the radio, see what I could pick up on a news feed there. I turn my radio on, nothing, no stations anywhere. AM, FM, it's dead. Now I'm really starting to wonder what's going on. And so I'm probably going to go, I'm going to say, I'm done with the meeting. I'm going to go home and check on uh, my wife or the kids or whatever, and I'll get in my truck, and hopefully it'll start. Start to head home, and I look at the gas gauge, and I'll crap. It's pretty close to empty. I was going to fill up before I came to the meeting, and I forgot to do that. So I'm going to run down here to Weldon Spring to the QT and fill up, because this might be serious, and it'd probably be good to have a full tank of gas. I get to QT, pull up to the pump, their lights are all out too, walk up there, try to swipe my credit card, nothing works. So I'm like, well, all right, maybe I can pay with cash. I'll run inside. Nobody carries much cash anymore on them. I'll go into their ATM inside. I go in there, that doesn't work either. All right, so maybe now a little panic is starting to set in. This is the kind of scenario that could play out if we had an EMP. Anybody know what an EMP is? An electromagnetic pulse could take out the grid, big sections of the grid. Wouldn't have to be an EMP attack. It could be a big solar flare or what they call a CME, coronal mass ejection. I think I read a story the other day that said there's like a 10 or 11 percent chance the earth could be hit by a major CME from the sun in the next 10 years. That's a pretty good sized chance. So, uh, and it wouldn't have to be any of those. Let me give you another example. This happened uh, last year out in Arizona. Some vandals cut uh, some fiber optic lines and a whole area in Arizona couldn't use the internet, their cell phones wouldn't work. Businesses couldn't process credit card transactions, ATMs didn't work, law enforcement databases were unavailable. If you were there, you might be wondering what in the heck was going on at that time. Fortunately, it only lasted a few hours, and they were able to find where these vandals had cut the, uh, the fiber optics. But it just speaks to how dependent all of us are these days on cell phones, on the internet, on that sort of thing. And if that would all go away, where would it leave you, communications-wise? Here's a few more examples, some that are fairly close to home. A few years ago, we had a pretty good-sized tornado rip through Bridgeton. Actually, it touched down out here in New Mali and a couple other places on the way down there. Um, the folks that were impacted directly, they were in trouble for quite a while. Joplin had one worse than that, an F5. You guys all remember that. 
the hospital was destroyed. They had to rebuild the hospital. Communication locally for them was very bad. When that sort of thing happens, cell phone towers are so overloaded, you're not going to pick up your cell phone and call somebody. <coughs> Ham radio operators did a lot of uh, volunteer work there. Hurricane Katrina, same thing, was probably larger, more widespread than the Joplin tornado, lasted longer. People were living in the uh, Superdome. It was not good. We had Ferguson riots here, what, two years ago. Uh, we were wondering what might happen there. Fortunately, nothing very significant in the way of widespread communications disruptions. But there's a reason when you look at all these things that police, EMS, firefighters, they all use radios. Those guys don't use cell phones. Because when it all goes bad, those things aren't going to work. Um, every county has a group of sky-worn ham radio operators that are activated during severe, severe weather events. Um, there's about 30 hospitals in the metro region that have a network of ham radio operators to call on if needed. Yesterday I was out at St. Joe West, Lake St. Louis, participating in their practice drill where all these hospitals talk to one another on the radio. And uh, we have groups like ARIES, you know, Amateur Radio Emergency Services. These guys practice for emergency events all the time. So how about you guys setting yourself up with a means of communication that doesn't rely on you listening to broadcast TV or radio, cell phones, or the Internet? <coughs> So what are small alternatives if you wanted to do that, to communicate by radio? Well, it starts small. I think all of us probably in our lives use these little walkie-talkies. I remember using them for the first time when I was a kid in grade school. They sell them. Now they're pretty cheap. You buy a Bass Pro, Cabela's, Walmart. They work great, but they don't have much range. Um, they come in various flavors, FRS, GMRS, MERS. Each of those has a little more range, but they're really pretty limited. Um, everybody remember CBs? CB radio? I had one back in the 70s. Boy, that was all the rage. Everybody had a CB. The truckers still use them, and this might be a good source of information if there were a widespread disaster. These guys are traveling cross country. They might bring information with them. You could listen or talk to them on CB. But what I'd like to talk about more today is amateur radio or ham radio. It's been around for a long, long time. And uh, as I say, there are volunteer organizations that help out in disasters. Well, you can do this from your home or from your car as well. All right, a lot of stuff on the screen here, but basically what I want to tell you is, you might ask, how far, how many miles can I reach with these different things? Well. The walkie-talkies I talked about are down here, FRS, GMRS, MERS. In the best of conditions, you might get 2 to 10 miles or so out of them. When the leaves are on the trees and everything else, you're probably talking more like a mile or two. And if you have some hills and valleys, that'll cut it down. CB radio, if you have a real powerful one, you might get 10, 15, 20 miles of range out of that. The ham radio, um, We'll talk more about the different frequencies and bands. You can locally, with a little handheld and a, and a decent antenna, get perhaps 15 or 17 miles. It's very good for locally around a, you know, a, a county or a couple of counties. And then if you have what we call HF, which can do really long distance, you can talk all over the country or even around the world. It's pretty amazing. A little radio sitting over there on the table. I've talked to like 50 or 60 different countries. All right, and here's the only technical part of the lesson today, but I want to. This illustrates the difference between what we call VHF, very high frequency, UHF, ultra high frequency. Remember when your television had that on there? Channel 30 was UHF, and channel 2, 4, and 5 was VHF. Same thing. This stuff is what we call line of sight. The radio can reach another radio if there's not a mountain in between you or a building in between you that's going to block it. All right? 
and this is the stuff that works well around the county if you get your antenna up on top of your roof or the guys that have them on top of a water tower for a repeater um, it works very well around the metro area and we use it this group practices on it. HF high frequency is longer wavelength and what it does is it bounces off the atmosphere so you can bounce off the atmosphere and come back down and be talking to somebody in California or in London. I've even talked to New Zealand with that little radio. But that's how we're able to talk to, you know, maybe more importantly, regionally, Kansas City or Chicago or something like that. How does that relate to shortwave and longwave? Shortwave, uh, they're similar. They're in these frequency ranges. I could show you a chart. If you got a shortwave radio, it's a receiver only, you can't transmit, but you can listen to these hand bands on your shortwave radio. Okay. And they have broadcast stations, you know, shortwave. I don't listen to the BBS and some others, don't they? Don't they for years had? Yeah, BBC and BBC. Voice of America used to be on that. Yep. Same frequencies and same thing. It's bouncing off the atmosphere. I'll skip right past this in just a moment, but this is a chart that shows you all the different frequencies and bands that are available to hams. And there are a couple of them in blue, 40 and 80 meters, that work great for regional communications out to maybe 500 miles or so. The one in yellow, 20 meters, is really good for long distance if I want to talk to somebody in California or in London. And then the one circled in red is 2 meters, and that's the one that gets used locally with a little handheld or with a mobile unit in your truck or from your house. That's what our Oath Keepers and militia folks around here use to talk to one another. So ham radio has been around for decades and decades. Um, and there are guys that are in it, that I kind of consider ham radio nerds, you know. They're into it for the sake of the, the radio stuff. What we're looking at it for here is part of our preparedness plan. It's how might we communicate with other folks if we didn't have cell phones and all that stuff. And so there's a group that started up just about five years ago called AMRON, the American Readout Radio Operators Network. They started out there in the Northwest. There's a lot of preparedness folks that have relocated out there. But a lot of us around the country said, hey, you don't have to be out there to use this. And it has grown in four or five short years from you know, maybe a couple of hundred people. There are now like two or three thousand members of this group called AMRON. And what I like about them is they're trying to apply this ham radio stuff to us everyday folks and how we could use it for emergency communications for us preparedness minded folks. And so we've kind of borrowed this model of theirs. Um, see if I can explain this. <coughs> What they suggest is, you know, ham operators, everybody doesn't need to be a long distance ham operator, but if you had one or two or three in a group like us that could talk long distance, and then the rest of us here locally could just talk on uh, walkie talkies or CB or whatever, and we could disseminate this information locally. So they have this project and it's really grown, they call it the Channel 3 Project. Make it easy to remember. If you've got a walkie-talkie on FRS, talk on channel three. If you've got a MERS walkie-talkie, use channel three. If you're on a CB, use channel three. And the idea is, um, for example, our group, Oath Keepers and our militia group here in Missouri, we've got three or four, maybe five operators now that are hams that can do this long distance stuff. And we could do the heavy lifting on on long range communications, figure out what's going on. If we had a, an EMP that knocked out the grid through the whole center of the United States, we could be the guys that do that. And then locally, we could get on what's called two meter. And this is a, sorry, the map's not great, but this is, you know, St. Louis, North County, St. Charles County, Franklin County, Jeff County. And these are some of our more active Oath Keeper ham members that got their entry level license and can talk on two meters. So if I got some information I wanted to share with the whole group on HF from California, then I could get on two meters 
and we could share this all around a several county area here locally. <coughs> So, I want to say something else there. And you could look at this the other way around. It doesn't have to be information coming in. It could be that we've had a disaster here and we want to send the information out. For example, let's say uh, New Madrid. We have a big quake. Things go to heck here in the St. Louis area communications out. I've got a son in California who's wondering, hey, Dad, are you all right? Or I'd be happy to help you folks if you have family and friends outside the area. You're unable to reach them by cell phone. Can't send them an email. Things are, are gone there. But we can help one another here locally, which we definitely be doing if an earthquake had knocked out a lot of things. We could be talking with each other, but we could also then get information out to your family and loved ones and friends elsewhere. So it could be a two-way flow. And then lastly, you could imagine some little spider diagrams like this for each one of these folks in their very immediate vicinity, just their neighbors, folks down the road. And you could use little walkie-talkies for that. That's the idea behind this AMRON Channel 3 project, is you layer ham radio long distance on top of ham radio locally, on top of little walkie-talkies or MERS radios locally. Put it all together. And typically, years ago, the hams were kind of like, hey, we're the experts, we know all this stuff, and just let us take care. These guys, Amron, are trying to get everybody involved and use this for emergency communications. So. I told you I'd like to leave you motivated to get your ham license. It's not hard. You don't have to be an electrical engineer to get your ham license. My wife's a music therapist and she has her ham license, okay? I'm not criticizing her, I'm just saying she's not real good at math and science. <laughs> but there's three levels. There's a technician level, then the next step up is general, and the next step up is extra. I would recommend everybody consider getting their technician license. The test is, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But this allows you to talk on the two meter band that I've spoke of that can do local communications. If you then take the second test, which is a little tougher, but still it's kind of, they're all multiple choice and you can really just kind of memorize the stuff. And when you really learn is when you get on the air. So get your test and get on the air. But the general license would let you talk long distance. And then the extra license, in my own personal opinion, that's for the ham nerds. And it gets you a little bit of extra band privileges, but not much more beyond the general. I got that book and I started studying it and I said, eh. <laughs> <laughs> So how can you get your ham license? Um, take a class, use a textbook or some online study guides. The way I did it was there's one of these little books for the tech class, there's one for the general, there's one for the extra. The test is, I think for technician, like 30 multiple choice questions. And they show you every single possible question. Now, there might be a hundred of them but you'll see every one that could possibly be on the test. I just went through here and I highlighted the correct answer and I just started reading through here and you actually have enough photographic memory almost that you can recognize the answer. Anyway, you go take a 30 question multiple choice test, pass it, pay them 15 bucks, you got your ham license, get on the air and practice. The St. Charles Ham Radio Club gives this test every fourth Monday of the month. The St. Louis Club does it down at the Cliff Cave Library <coughs> off of, uh, it's down by the JB Bridge, every week, every Tuesday night. So it's easy to take the test. And uh, lastly, I'll leave you with some resources. And if anybody's interested, I have a printed copy of this one page right here. You just pass this around, take one if you would like. There's some websites. 
The organization for hams in the U.S. is the ARRL. Um, there's a site called QRZ that lists everybody's call signs once you get your license, and they have all these practice tests on there. There's uh, some very active local ham clubs in the area, St. Charles County, St. Louis, and Franklin. And then our group, Oath Keepers of Greater St. Louis. So take a look at those websites. And that's what I had for today. My objective was to try to get you thinking enough and get you motivated that you would consider go uh, getting your ham license. Did I succeed? Anybody think it might be an interesting thing to go do? Sure. How much does it cost to buy a good radio? Sure, great question. How much does it cost to buy a good radio? Um, these little handhelds. These little uh, bow fangs are what, 30 bucks, <coughs> 40 bucks maybe? These are good for local communication. They're only like five watts or eight watts, but if you put a good antenna, like he's got curled up here on there, you could talk from my house out in Augusta to probably down to St. Charles. Minimum, I'd say 30, 40 bucks, another antenna like that, another 25 or 30 bucks. Step up a little bit, and get a rig like Kevin's here that's 75 watts. He's got a really cool one he put together here in a box with a bigger battery so it would run a lot longer. That radio is about.